better start. Most, I think most of you one way or another. Those of you I haven't, I'm very pleased to meet you for the first time. I'm Meg Crane. I'm a journal editor of the Wilfred Owen Association. For a while, I was the chair. Um, please make sure you're on mute for the early stages of this. Even the smallest noise disrupts the whole thing. So I can, I can hear that somebody's not on mute at the moment. I'm not sure who. Uh, I will leave time for questions. I'll just cut myself short if, if I don't finish uh, in time for questions. So don't be afraid you'll get squeezed out. Um, please, would you write any questions or comments in the chat box? And Jane is going to moderate them and choose really which ones we look at, I suppose, if, if there are, are any. Right. Uh, please, could we have document one, Jane and Bonnie, or whoever, whichever of you is doing it? Yeah. Um, also, just to add, we are also recording. Right. Oh, um, yes, we are recording. I'll share my screen. This isn't happening at the moment, Bonnie. Oh, here we are. And could we have the, the next slide? <coughs> right. It's, I'm very pleased to have Elizabeth Vanderhoek with us. It was an honor I didn't look for, but thank you for coming, Elizabeth. Obviously, there is masses written. A strange meeting. Uh, this could have been pages long. I've just chosen the three which I found most helpful, which are all fairly accessible. I'm sorry I forgot to fill in the details of Dominic Hibbard books. Owen the Poet dates from 1886, 1986, and was published by Macmillan. Wilfred Owen, a new biography, was by Nicholson in 2002. Um, please, could we have the next slide, Bonnie? Right. So there's the manuscript from the prep for the preface. Just in case you weren't aware, a lot of Owen's manuscripts look like this. It's a work of not only love, but considerable intelligence and forensic skill to transcribe them. And it's hardly surprising if occasionally there are variant readings. But anyway, this is what the preface looked like. I need to remind people, I suspect, or perhaps I don't, given the distinguished company, that as Jane told us last time, this was all a bit chaotic, producing the 1920 edition. Stuff was going backwards and forwards in the post. Sassoon set the thing up with the publishers and then went off to America, leaving Edith Sitwell to do the editing. Edith Sitwell obviously didn't have a scholarly training, although she was a highly intelligent woman. Sometimes she falls down on the transcriptions, not too, too often. But the differences between her transcription and the more accepted later ones are not that great in the preface, but we will look at the differences there are. So please could we have document three? Right, the line that leaps out, of course, in both of these is, the poetry is in the pity, which is endlessly quoted, isn't it? I've never felt terribly happy with that statement. It sounds a bit portentous. And Owen can be a little bit self-important at times, can't he? Although he undercuts himself rather charmingly in other places. But pity is a word that's shifted around, like charity, it's generated in meaning. Originally, it's related to pietas, meaning honor, respect, doing, doing what's due to people, um, veneration. Gradually, it comes to mean compassion, and then I think in modern times gets weakened to something a bit patronizing and not particularly useful. Same as the word charity. But Owen obviously means at least two things by pity, compassion on the one hand, and the other meaning of pity, as in, tis pity she's a whore, that restoration, no, sorry, revenge play. Um, meaning shame, a crying shame, an outrage, a tragedy. So I think both of those things are there. The following line, or the following three lines in Edith Sitwell's version, 
Yet these elegies are not to this generation. This is in no sense conservatory. I don't think she got that right. I think um, the, the transcription, which we're more used to, is the right one. London does it, De Lewis Stallworthy, all of whom, of course, were scholars. Yet these elegies are to this generation in no sense conservatory. They may be to the next. So two points there. He views his poems as elegies. So not primarily as poems of protest, which we might think, but as poems of lamentation, regret, honor, and not consolatory. Now, one element of the, the standard literary elegy is the consolatio at the end. Something is found to redeem the situation. Maybe just the memory of the dead one, or a new beginning of some kind, or a rebirth of some kind. Milton's Lycidas is a good example. Lycidas, your sorrow is not dead. And the very final line, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. The grief has been expressed and absorbed. Well, Owen sometimes does that and sometimes doesn't. He comes from a long tradition of English energy, of course, running from Milton at the very least through Gray, Shelley, Tennyson, Matthew Arnold. We know that Owen had a very good English literary education, partly from school, partly from his own reading. He was familiar with all those poets. Some of his pre-war work is already in the Jaya Canton. Um, Laconium, for instance, the poem about Keats is uh, the 90 years since Keats died. So it's a natural instinct in him anyway, in some cases. Now, I hesitate to say anything much about the classics, knowing how limited my own classical education is, but as I understand it, classical elegies were originally just a particular verse form, but gradually came to me, have this sense of a celebration of and lamentation for the dead. We do know, thanks to Elizabeth Vandiver's book, that um, Owen had been reading some Greek energies in the last year or so of his life. Sometimes in the energies of his mature period, he does allow himself a bit of a consolatio, in spite of what he says in the preface. The very last line of Anthem, perhaps, each slow dusk are drawing down the blinds. It's a melancholy consolation, but it's there. They will be remembered, they will be honored. Um, the end of a sleep, perhaps, who knows, who hopes, who troubles, let it pass. He sleeps, he sleeps less tremulous, less cold, than we who must awake, and waking say alas. On the other hand, there's a firm refusal for consolation and futility. Was it for this the play grew at all? Or in some of the others? We'll see, really, what, what we think about uh, strange meeting when it comes to that. Right, please could you, you pull up document four, Bonnie? We've got a bit of a sidestep here before we move on. Earth's wheels run oiled with blood, which appears as a separate poem in the 1920 edition. I gather you've got a link to the 1920 edition. Um, this is usually seen just as a, a run that um, strange meeting. Those of you who've got the London edition, I imagine we mostly have. There's, there are two pages of variant readings of various kinds. Dominic Hibbert, though, and I think he may well be right, suggests that this is a poem in its own right. Composed November 1917, I think we can tell that through Stallworthy taking the, the paper for very news. And Hibbert associates it with a poem that Owen evidently wrote to try and urge Sassoon not to go back to the front. Remember, Owen had been discharged from Craig at the beginning of November, Sassoon a week or two later. Here, he seems to be urging Sassoon not to go back and fight because there are things for him to do at home. Forget we that. Let us lie down and dig ourselves in thought. And then a tweaking of a line, two lines we will recognize. Beauty is yours and you have mastered. Wisdom is mine and I have mystery. The big difference in this is the pronouns, isn't it? It's we and you as well as I. It's 
serving a different purpose, although saying many of the same things. There are also, of course, some new lines, some lines that don't appear in Strange Meeting. We too will stay behind and keep our troth. A curious echo of the wedding ceremony there. And a change of grammar, misread a march, this retreating word, uh, a subjunctive. And then when their blood had clogged the chariot wheels, and Elizabeth's book uh, connects the chariot wheels with an image in Homer. Uh, it also turns up, of course, in Chapman's translation. Um, and I, we will go up and wash them in sweet and deep wells, rather than I would have done that. So there's the, we don't yet have that past conditional tense which gives it a note of regret and frustration. This is a poem of intention and hope. What though we think from men as pictures falling, I'm assuming that this is a biblical quotation. Um, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the system. I assume that's where Henry James got the image of the golden bowl as well. Um, the sense of something precious that in the end is bound to be destroyed or damaged. Even from wells we sunk too deep for war, and wells of course play a part in other own poems, notably the send-off, um, and filled by brows that led where no wounds were. So a slight change, and we notice an alternative line at the end, even as one who fled where no means were. And I think the capitalization makes it clear that he's referring here to Christ's agony in the garden and the drops of sweat like blood. It struck me in passing that this seems to be the version that Benjamin Britten must have had access to, since several of the variant lines that come up in the War Requiem uh, turn up here. Even from wells we sunk too deep for war. Who knows what, what Britain used as his base text, perhaps somebody does. Right, so Dominic Hibbert notes that Owen had been reading Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells and their gloomy view of the future and their feeling that all those who could see beyond the immediate situation could do would be to stand back while, while society and mankind ruined itself and only hope to have some effect in the end, which ties in quite well, I think, with Owen's sense of himself as a truth teller and a prophet. And of course, that echoes Shelley saying that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Well, Owen's appeal to Sassoon didn't work, as we know, Sassoon went back to active duty. And in a rather characteristically pragmatic way, Owen recycles the poem a few months later, by which time he's in Scarborough and Ritham, and uses a number of the same images and phrases and adjusts them for the new requirements of the new poem. So, Belfoni, please could we have them document five? Right. I'm not suggesting uh, uh, Owen knew this particular tunnel. It is from that song battlefield where he had his first experiences, uh, but it dates back to the 1916 battle. It's just there really um, to provoke our imaginations. I don't want to sound too reductive, but it did occur to me that given that he was the son of a railway employee, he must have been familiar with tunnels from a very early age. And I've noticed children are often horribly fascinated by tunnels. They find them thrilling but frightening and exciting. And so perhaps there may have been a, a relationship with the idea of a tunnel long before the writing of Strange Reading. He had dreams of being buried underground and stifled when he was done with them. There are quite a lot of images of being buried alive. Or, or darkness in the poems, including some of the early ones, like Euryconium. Um, also, of course, quite literally, it's one of the tunnels under the Hindenburg, uh, the Hindenburg line. But it also takes us back to 
classical times to the Aeneid, book four, no, book six, sorry, The Descent into the Underworld, and the Odyssey, book 11. Both Aeneas and Odysseus go into the underworld to find something out. Aeneas goes to seek out his father, Anchises. And um, Odysseus goes down to find the prophet, Thyresis. I see the, the link has come up. Um, we know Owen didn't have any Greek, but he was reading about Greek literature and he'd read some in translation. As I said, and this is uh, courtesy of Elizabeth, it seems likely that it would have been Chapman's translation he read. Chapman, the Elizabethan poetry playwright. Uh, the translation appeared between, I think, 1598 and 1616. Um, He'd done a certain amount of Latin at school, only up to what I suppose we could call roughly a level standard. Uh, we know he had read Caesar's Gallic Wars because he had a copy of it. Um, on the other hand, he was steeped in that tradition because of his knowledge of English poets. And as we know, he was a great self improver and autodidact. So although he may not have been able to read much in the original, he will have soaked up the ideas and the images. Well, you could spend the whole of a, a lecture on string theory just looking at the influences, and I'm not going to do that to you. Um, there, are there are plenty of books to read there, and most of us, I think, encountered the poem long before we knew about any of its associations. So we've got the Catabasis, the journey into the underworld, the journey into the unknown, and the poem exists in his own right. We could get mired down, like the chariot wheels. We'll try and look at the overarching ideas and a few of the details. One thing that comes up sometimes is whether or not the poem is finished. Could we have document six up, please, Bonnie? This is um, Owen's contents page. It's not very easy to read, I'm afraid. Strange meeting is the fifth item up from the bottom. And against it, there's a four, which seems to relate to the number of pages Owen expected it to fill. On the strength of that, some people have suggested that we've only got half of it. I think it's perhaps more likely that Owen was envisaging a small, a smaller book, I mean, physically a smaller book, in the normal size. Um, I've got here, I don't know whether if we could go back to the um, main screen for a minute. Only if we could. Right, I don't know whether anybody can see where I am, but this is a copy of Versus and the Scholar Gypsy, Gypsy, appropriately. It's what's called small octaven, which is something like five inches by eight. There were smaller things still, hello Elizabeth, called Duodecimo. Um, I think possibly Owen was thinking that he, his book would be one of those, and then it would have occupied probably about four pages. Please, could we go back to that page, Bonnie? Oh, gone away again. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yeah, You'll right. see that several other poems are described as having four pages as well. The Women and the Slain, which isn't a particularly long poem. Nothing Happens, which is obviously exposure. And um, Apologia pro Poemate Neo. They're all of a part, mostly of comparable length, a strange meeting. So I think this suggests perhaps that it's just he was imagining a smaller format. However, I don't know that, and I'm sure it could be argued. There's also, this may be quite unconnected, the fact that Keats finishes Hyperion with a broken ending, which presumably he could have completed if he'd chosen to. Uh, Owen may be paying tribute to Keats, maybe imitating Keats in that way. I don't know. So we have the journey into the underworld, 
We have the caves and passages which turn up in the poetry of the Romantics. We've got the tunnels of the Hindenburg Line. We've maybe even got a tunnel of Owen's childhood. All the earlier poets have gone down into the underworld, and I should have mentioned Dante, to find something out, to learn. And here, our poet does learn, but that's not what he goes there for. He seems to wander there, more or less by accident, and finds himself in a tunnel which titanic walls have grown. So we're back in the world of the ancient Greek gods, the ones who were overthrown by the next generation of Greek gods. So there's a sense of immense time running through this poem, as well as of immense space. The earlier drafts of the poem had flames in the tunnel, like, like Dante's hell. That gets dropped, and it, instead it's a deep, dark tunnel, more like pagan hells. Well, as well as the classical legends, of course, there are the Celtic and Germanic legends. Bonnie, please could we have documents seven and eight? I don't know whether they can go side by side. If not, shall we just have seven? Thank you. This is a relatively tidy manuscript, as you see. It's not terribly difficult to read. And as you'll see if you look at the 1920 version, there are only minor variations from the version we all know. If we have a look at the 1920 text, the main differences are omission of the line by his dead smile, I knew this was in hell. Although it's there on the manuscript, just crossed out. A thousand fears instead of a thousand pains. A comma between strange and friend. That's six lines from the bottom. And I can't see a comma on the manuscript. That must have been just a mistake. And something has been left rather than something had been left. That'll be on the next page. So they're just transcription mistakes, I think. It's, it's hard to see that there can be anything more significant than that underneath it. Well. As well as the, the classical legends, there were the Germanic and Celtic legends about the sleepers under the hill. There's also the Germanic legend, of course, of the doppelganger, where a speaker or a voyager or a traveller meets himself. Um, since Owen was musically well educated, he may have known the Schubert song to Words by Heine, in which um, a, a lover who's lost his love a long time ago returns to the place where he knew her and sees his young self grieving there. And that poem's actually called The Bottle Dinner. Um, we had recently in the Wilfred Owen Association Journal an article about Mary Williams' play, also called The Bottle Dinner, in which Owen is paralleled with the German poet Gerrit Engelke, who died at about the same time. And Owen probably knew some of the other instances of the double gamer. For instance, there's a story by Poe called William Wilson. There's a picture by Rossetti called How They Met Themselves. Uh, Dennis Welland gives an account of, of some of this. So it was a theme that was popular in the late 19th century, meeting yourself coming back. Um, there's also, and I don't know whether this is an intentional parallel or not, but it struck me, there are two monologues in Henry VI, part three, uh, a father who's killed his son, and a son who's killed his father. There might even be some kind of parallel there. People realising too late what they've done and what they've lost. Well, if we turn to the poem itself, so much has been written about it in a way that any anything I've got to say is superfluous. It's, an, it's probably the most striking example of Owen's use of power rhyme. Some of his best known poems actually, of course, use perfectly traditional rhyme, like Dulce et Decorum and Anthem. It's on the whole the later mature poems that make use of it. And the critic Middleton Murray 
referred to Pararain as producing an effect of remoteness, darkness, emptiness, shock. I think maybe, as well as all that, we've got perhaps the distorting echoes of the tunnel. Everything coming back in slightly different form. Well, so it seems that out of battle I escaped. He doesn't deliberately go to this tunnel, he just finds himself there. Scooped by the Titans, yet also there encumbered sleepers grown. And in one of his letters, he mentions the encumbered passageways in the London Underground. Possibly soldiers with their packs. It harks back again to Chapman's translation of Homer. And I've got a slide at the end, which we'll use at this time, pointing out a particular line or two there. Encumbered sleepers, and he probes them. Possibly they're a reference to Sassoon's poem, uh, The Rear Guard where the speaker pokes a soft unanswering heap, cursing it and trying to make it give him instructions before he realises it's dead. This is a different kind of shock because the second speaker leaps to his feet with piteous recognition in fixed eyes. And Hibbert mentions how often eyes turn up in their poems particularly blind eyes or bulging eyes, prominent eyes of some kind. Lifting distressful hands as if to bless. So a sort of alternative religious gesture. With a thousand pains, fears, as he just said, well, pains seems to be what they're in mode. That vision space was brained Yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns thumped or down the flues made moan. So for a moment, the tunnel even seemed like a sewer. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None of the other, save the undone years. So undone is not just incomplete, but reversed, unraveled, wrecked. Whatever hope is yours was my life also. And now we've got the echo of that original fragment, Earth's wheels run oiled with blood. You, I, yours, mine. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or breathe it there. So there's a suggestion that beauty is dangerous, as so often in the romantic poets. Think, for example, of Keats's La Belle Grand Saint Merci. But mocks the steady running of the hour, mocks the steady running of the hour. This is a young man faced with the, the constant possibility of death and the sense of time running and perhaps running out, as in an hourglass. And if it grieves, grieves richly over here. I think Owen steers a fairly precarious course between anachronism and uh, reasonably vernacular use of the language here. Richlier is one of his more excessive uses, I think, of um, elevated language, but perhaps he gets away with it. For by my glee, and that's a surprising word, isn't it? Glee suggesting high excitement. Originally just means music and entertainment, of course, but I think by the tw early 20th century it had come to mean an almost excessive joy. By my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something had been left, which must die now. I think Owen's mastery of the caesura, the break in the middle of the sentence, is very striking here. Which must die now, a turning point, a volta. I mean the truth untold, the pity of war, the pity of war distilled. So war purified, refined pity. Now and then we'll go content with what we spoiled, or discontent, boil bloody, and be spilled. They will be swift with swiftness of the tigress. And of course, the tiger is traditionally the most cruel of animals. The lion is generous. The tiger is, is ruthless. None will break ranks, though nations trek from progress. So we have here the sense of huge armies marching away from the future, away from enlightenment, 
Courage was mine and I had mystery. Wisdom was mine and I had mastery. Mystery, I think, two senses here, possibly even three. Um, mystery as in the sense of something that needs to be solved, something that's not immediately understood. Also, perhaps in the religious sense, like the sacred mysteries, something out of the ordinary, supernatural. And also in the sense that Othello means it when he tells um, Desdemona's maid to get set about her mystery, meaning her craft, her calling. So this is Owen celebrating the, the human qualities, courage and wisdom, and the technical skills, mystery and mastery. To miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled. Another reading is old citadels, but I think vain makes the point, doesn't it, that it can only end in disaster and extinction. A citadel that's not war and they surrender. Then when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels, I would go up and wash them from sweet wells, and we've talked about that already. I would, even with truths that lie too deep for taint. So a sweet well contrasts with the idea of pollution, impurity. I would have poured my spirit without stint, but not through wounds, not on the cess of war. So the suggestion of blood and urine, waste and squalor. Foreheads of men have bled when the wounds were. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. Elizabeth Vandiver's book points out two, two places in the Iliad where People who might be thought to be enemies address one another as friend. And since Owen probably only knew the poem, the, the Iliad in translation, uh, he may well have picked up on that without being aware that they're not exactly the same word in the Greek. I am the enemy you killed, my friend. I knew you in this dark. So you frowned yesterday, Uno, as you jabbed and killed. And this ties in with one of Owen's dreams about killing the man and killing him again. I parried, but my hands were loath and cold. The second speaker in the end lacked the will to save himself. Let us sleep now. So we've got this incomplete or broken ending, which we may choose to think is complete or not. Who is he talking to, the second speaker? Is he talking solely to the first speaker? Let, let the two of us now lie down and sleep. The doppelganger, meeting the doppelganger and lying down in peace with him, almost like a lover. Or is he talking to his audience? Let us sleep now. Don't repeat this. Let us rest in peace. In either case, it's a sort of consolatory, I think. Uh, not much of one, perhaps, but like the end of Anthem for Doing Youth, the sense of a sorrowful, melancholy peace and resignation. And some of you will remember that there's a poem in Ted Hughes's Birthday Letters where he imagines himself with his wife's father, Otto, a German, lying down together like Owen with his German. So a sense, perhaps, of reconciliation and not entire hopelessness in spite of what Owen said earlier in the poem. Right, so I think this is the point for me to ask people to submit to uh, put their questions and um, over to you Jane. Okay, thank you Meg. That's amazing. I'm sure people might have things they want to add. I've got a few things I've written down but I thought I could um, I can open it to the floor. There may be people who are dying to ask questions. Um, Bonnie, would you like me just to um, do this bit for you? Sure. I'm going to step on our events organizer's toes. Um, yes, I think Thomas uh, Muldoon, you had a, your hand up. Did you? Um, that was an applause. Oh, an applause. But okay. Can, yes, I think can... applause is good, actually. Let's do yeah. applause first. <laughs> That's good. Um, Thank you. As you've given me the opportunity to speak, I'd like to say that um, I've observed in other ways, in other times and places, how much people 
of our generation and older can contribute. And I don't believe you can bottle the value of somebody who's passionate about a subject and who just matures with it and can give what you've just given Meg. You undervalue yourself, I think. And I really enjoyed it. And I think it's, uh, I hope you carry on doing it. It was amazing. Well done. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely, Meg. Oh, you can do the rest of them if you want. We've had <laughs> I'll have you again. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Tim Fellows has put a question in the chat. Um, why do we think the editors chose to open the book with this poem? Thank you, Tim. That was exactly my question. Yes. <laughs> yes, that crossed my mind too. Um, I think before the poems were dated, people often thought this was Owen's last poem, didn't they? Because it feels like the summation of something. It feels like a conclusion. I suppose Edith Sitwell put it first because it seemed the most solemn and impressive. I don't, I don't yeah, know. And it, it was in wheels, wasn't it, as well? I mean, I was thinking about this question too, if, if I may just jump in, and I was looking at my, I've got my edition sitting here, and it's interesting because in the, London in his edition in 1930 puts it at the end, and C. Day Lewis in his edition puts it at the beginning. Um, so, and then John Stallworthy in his edition that just the, the shorter war poems, but I think it, it mimics the larger text. He's got it as 21st out of 46 poems and he puts spring offensive at the end. So it is interesting to think about the placement in these editions and what decisions were made as a result. So, mm. yeah. It's a very strong poem. So I think beginning or end is a good place for it. Yes, yes. Um, there was a question um, um, from Elizabeth uh, Vandiver. Um, I have a question about Let Us Sleep Now. Elizabeth, did you want to unmute? And yes, yes I always thank forget you. that I need to unmute. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much, Meg. That was wonderful, and very, very rich and thought provoking. I have always had I suppose a third possibility in mind for how we read Let Us Sleep Now at the end, I think the first impulse is to take that as a subjunctive. Let us, as we now use in the contraction, let's, let's sleep, let's eat, let's go. But let can also mean allow. And it could be that the strange friend is saying to the speaker, oh, the Owen character of the poem, allow us to sleep, go away, leave us alone. Yes. And if you take it that way, then the poem ends on much less of a consolatio that also ties in more with the classical catabasis, which of course is my shtick, but um, it ties in more with that because Odysseus, Aeneas, Heracles, um, Theseus, the other heroes who travel to the underworld, do all travel back yes. to the land of the living and report on what they saw in the underworld. Yes. Owen implicitly has traveled back to the land of the living because he's left us this poem, I mean, the, that he is reporting on what he saw, said, and heard in the underworld. So I think, I don't think this could be resolved. I'm not saying that the let sleep reading is wrong. And in fact, I think that's the one that immediately presents itself to the mind. But I think we also should allow for the strange friend saying, this is it, I've told you what I am going to tell mm -hmm. you. Now you return to the world and allow us here, the encumbered sleepers, to continue to sleep. That has the whole new there, doesn't it? That, that interpretation. Yes, I'd be interested to know if others think there's any validity to that. Well, I think we could we could have a bit of negative capability here, couldn't we? We can believe all three. Yes, I think so. Oh, I think so. I think so. I think it's. Uh, I'm. I'm not trying to say one is right and another is wrong by any means. Uh, the line is deeply ambiguous, mm. but I rather like holding that ambiguity in mind mm. for the poem. No, thank you very much. I mean, that's that's something that's added to the reading of it now. That's just yeah, thank you. absolutely brilliant. Yes. Okay. Another... May I offer a, a suggestion? 
Sure, Paul, please, Paul Norgate, yeah. please. I'm, I'm interested in Elizabeth's contribution there that let may carry some of that sense of allow. I mean, one, one of the things, it's, I have to say, strange meeting has never been one of my favorites. It strikes me as rather over portentous in all directions, but it does have connections for me with a much more direct piece, exposure. And particularly that final stanza the burying party picks and shovels in their shaking grasp, pours over half known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. When the half known face is surely exactly who he encounters yes. down in the dugout. And the whole mood of exposure is, if you like, one of paralysis. They are literally frozen. They cannot escape the war. They're not even allowed to die properly. They are frozen in all, all respects. And, and asking for a release would seem to fit very well with both of those poems. Yes. If I can jump in on that. Um, thank you, Paul. That That's brilliant. And I think that ties beautifully with the line and exposure slowly our ghosts drag home where the the men try to return home but are prevented from doing so and if i'm remembering right that stanza closes with we turn back to our dying um i think you're right there's definitely a relationship there yes i mean th th those last four or five stanzas all play around the possibilities or otherwise of dying or not dying. Are we dying? Is this to do with God or not? Yes. And it's unresolved, isn't it? The, the darkness continues, the emptiness, the exposure, the nothingness, nothing happens. Yes. We can't go either way. No. Hmm. It's also the traumatic self, isn't it? It's, it's the sort of, you know, is the doppelgamer and then there's the traumatic the one who experiences the trauma, the neurasthenic, the shell shocked. It's a mental, I can't go home, I can't go back. So there's a, the double is also, and I'm sure other scholars have come up with this, it's just, because um, as you say, that's, you know, so much wonderful work has been done on this, but I think that's also an interesting reading is, is the sense that it's a, it's the other, it's the other self that he's speaking to. And no, knowing Owen's history of, of, you know, mental cases and, and having that traumatic past and we you know in trauma theory of course is about the constant repetition of the experience and I think he does that as well yeah mm -hmm. and also in the show we've got this suspension mm -hmm. haven't we between life and death this uncertainty about who's alive and who's dead uh, um um Marcello Giovanelli has a question thank you Meg a great talk it strikes me um Marcello, I don't know whether you wanted to say this yourself. Um, he says he can't at the bottom. Oh, his children, <laughs> yes. Okay, fine. No problem. I'll do it for you. Fine. <laughs> so ha happy to have people chime in. Um, he says, great talk. Strikes me that the poem is very spatial, uh, directional um, in its language. There are lots of references to notions in, out, up, down, throughout the position, the reader uh, that position the reader to conceptualize the physical and mental states of the speakers and characters. Even the second speaker's death um, framed in that way, you frown through me. So the sense of dynamic movement is there apart from, of course, at the end where there is a marked stasis, let us sleep. Also, this prevents a return um, to the framing speaker. Incidentally, I see this a bit like Keats's La Belle Dame. And then, sorry, I can't come to the mic as I have a noisy kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Meg, or uh, does anyone else want if I can chip in again then, Jane, sorry, I'm, I don't want to cut anybody else off. But again, I think that's a, a perceptive insight into the poem. I mean, there, there are quite a lot of Owen's poems which move in all sorts of ways, across time, forward, backward, looking into the future, looking back, reflecting on where we are now, all bound up with the physical movement or lack of it mm. in the battlefields or wherever. I mean, Dulcet Decorum is, is 
you know, a, a time shift. It, it moves across generations to the, the friend somewhere else and the children who haven't got there yet. Um, the, the strange, not strange meeting, sorry, spring offensive. Uh, it, it, all these things seem to be characteristic of Owen. And, and the send off. And the, yes, thank you, Meg, exactly, the send off. Yes. Um, which prompts me another comment. You mentioned earlier on the, the, the mention of wells, which seems to be a, something that Owen pokes around at several times. I mean, it, it appears in a draft of Anthem and it's in um, the send off and it's here again. I, I think Dominic Hibbard suggests at one point that strange meeting post dates the German offensive um, in, in March. I mean, the, the, the mention of wells might be more related perhaps to the retreat to the Hindenburg line uh, and the, the scorched earth policy. But um, he, whether, whether he picked that up from other people or not, I don't know. But again, movement to somewhere else, which might be better or might not. I'll shut up a bit now, sorry. Well, no, actually that, that gives us a link, doesn't it, to the retreating armies moving over a devastated okay. landscape. Yes. Nice one. Um, of course, the rear guard is a direct source. Um, Vivian Welton says. Vivian, did you want to say yes, that? Yes, I mean, the Hindenburg Tunnel is, is clearly the origin, isn't it, in Sassoon's The Rear Guard. Yes. Um, Bonnie, could you put the final slide up? Because that's got the text of The Rear Guard. Sorry, Viv, carry on. No, I just wanted to say that in, in terms of the war itself, that that's the direct source, isn't it? That experience of. The soon I imagine so. At the Battle of Arras. Mm. Interesting that Sassoon manages to unload his hell behind him. Mm. Yes. And it's characteristic of Sassoon that he's on his own. He doesn't meet anyone answer him or enlighten him or share wisdom with him. He just encounters an unspeaking cause. Uh, so soon always, or so often anyway, positions himself as completely alone. Mm -hmm. David, uh, Ryan, did you want to pose your question or would you like me to read it out? Out. I was just uh, wanted to thank Meg and uh, wanted to ask uh, how prevalent was Pararyme at the time of writing, as it seems to lend otherworldliness to the poem. Um, so I just. Well, as I understand it, Owen was the first person to use Pararyme systematically. I mean, there are isolated examples of it. Um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I believe, uses it from time to time. But Owen makes a point of it, doesn't he? And as far as I know, nobody has done that before. But I'm waiting to be put right about that. I believe that's right. Um, my understanding is that Owen invented strict power rhyme where the cluster of consonants remains the same, but the vowel changes. Um, cold, killed for instance, um, all throughout Strange Meeting, the, the consonants are the same, tigress, progress, well, they're okay. The, the first, the tie and the pro are slightly different. I think that's the least successful pararyme in the poem, actually. But my understanding is that he invented it and that that's one thing that Middleton Murray um, praises him for really quite, um, extravagantly in his review of the 1919 issue of Wheels, where he says that Strange Meeting outranks any other poem that's uh, in that issue or in the Georgian anthology that came out at about the same time. And Middleton Murray specifically 
highlights Owen's invention of pararime as uh, part of what makes the poem so powerful. So if anyone else had used it systematically before, I'd be very interested to hear about it. But I think Meg is right that Owen invented it. I was thinking about Hopkins. I, I, yes. I'm trying to think when Hopkins was published. I was going to say, I think... I think Sally's right. I was going to say, I think there's some, there's people who use it and he, you know, I think he would have, you know, and I think it's in Welsh poetry as well. It's a feature. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I, my I understanding is that the Welsh, whatever the Welsh equivalent is, is somewhat different. Doesn't mm -hmm. work the same way with strong consonant, um, similarity and shift in vowels, but I don't know. I don't, read Welsh, I don't speak Welsh. Um, I, I can't, I don't know it, but just, I've, I've actually been working on Strange Meeting the last few days and the things I have looked at just recently have said that the Welsh technique really isn't all that mm. similar. Hopkins, Hopkins is a good suggestion. I haven't looked at him in that regard. It just um, immediately came to mind, uh, but, um, but I think probably not using it deliberately in the way that right. Owen is using it. Right. And not yeah, as, I think Owen is making a thing. Yeah. And not Owen as making a thing of it. Scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Not as the guiding rhyme scheme of an entire poem. Perhaps. No. No. But when that, Hopkins uses it, it's it's one of his many forms of paradox. Um, I'm trying to I can't remember the quotation well enough, but there's there's a line that begins this Jack joke something or other, something or other, is a mortal diamond. Uh, and it's a, a poem about everything being the opposite of what it seems, and all contrasts and opposites being merged in God, presumably. Um, which isn't really what Owen's saying, but it's an interesting use of sound in the same way. Andrew Palmer had something. Yeah. You had your hand up, Andrew. Yes, can you hear me? Um, yes. I, um, what bothers me about Strange Meeting is, um, the pararime para is like a damaged rhyme or, you know, it seems appropriate to the war. And I think somebody, um, is it Welland, has written, a, wrote ages ago a, a good article about this, about how, you know, this is not the time for the sweetness of rhyme. And, and so it's, you know, it seems like a good idea. But what's wrong with Strange Meeting is he, he whacks you over the head with it, line after line after line. So it works in futility because you don't really notice it's happening. You're just vaguely aware that something's not right. Whereas here it's couplet after couplet after couplet, scooped, scoped or whatever it is over and over again. And by the time you've got to the end, it's become a trick. Mm. And, and for me, that's what, you know, that's why this, you know, there's so much in this poem, you know, that's great and a value, but that sort of undermines it for me because it, it just becomes a trick by the time, by the time you're about halfway through and you've spotted mm -hmm. it, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. I think I'm inclined to agree with you. M minors is another one where it's done much more subtly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Right. Does it in spring offensive too? I mean, that it's the subtle nature of it. And I think given the unfinished nature mm -hmm. of strange meeting, you can argue he probably knew that, but he's yeah playing with it, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's impressive that he came up with that many, you know, but... <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah. But it's okay. interesting that he, he seems to have hit upon its not specifically as a, a means of conveying anything about the war. I mean, some of the earliest examples are things like Song of Songs and Has Your Soul Sit, yes. which are earliest Craig Lockhart, if not before in some cases. And mm. in those poems, I mean, he's not particularly, well, perhaps more in Has Your Soul Sit, but certainly in um, Song of Songs, he's not looking for any sort of incompleteness or discord. Mm. Uh, did, I, interesting again that, that Sassoon responded to that one as a musical achievement not possible to me. So Sassoon clearly recognized that Owen was up to something with Pararine that was at least interesting, mm. um, not possible to him, useful, valuable, who knows, but it was different. And then there is that reference in one of his letters, Jane will remember this one, I can't remember where it comes, but he, I think he writes to Leslie Gunston and says, I'm doing in poetry what some of the advanced composers are doing in music, which again may be a, a reference or not to his rhyming 
or to something else. Yes, I think it was. And, and I think in particularly in the Leslie uh, case, you know, part of what he writes back and forth to Sassoon and, and does get a little irritated with Leslie is that Leslie's poems in, in The Nymph and other poems are so um, regular. He's not, you know, they're so conventional. And he said, I'm, there's just too many kisses in it. And you know. <laughs> of course, we don't have Leslie's letter to Owen. <laughs> but no. my impression from the response where Owen says, I'm doing in, in poetry what musicians are doing in music is that Leslie strongly disliked. He does. Uh, he thinks that he, it, 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 it's bad rhyming. I think yeah. that's what he thought. it's bad yeah. rhyming. Um, yeah. And Owen is rather huffy in his response. And I say, you know, well, you want to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on your violin. Exactly. I <laughs> and, um, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm doing half tone, you know, atonal and it, music and you don't get it, yes. Yeah, and the discussion that was actually left out of the letters that I'm reinstating is the discussions around Leslie. Oh, wonderful. Because it's stuff that it's it's in the instance where Bell and Owen note, we have removed 12 yeah. lines or whatever. So it was never, and it, that was the, ins those were the instances in which they felt it would offend living people. And Leslie was still um, living at that point, right? And so that's what's, that's what's going back in. But it is interesting. He has this and he gets annoyed with with the Gunstons for various reasons. Um, uh, and, you know, that's one of them. And the exchange with Sassoon is quite, you know, because Sassoon hates the stuff, basically. And he's trying to sort of temper it, but you can see him getting very irritated with both of them. Um, sorry. Can I, but... can I just add something which is not half as erudite as the lovely contributions? And thank you so much, Meg, and, and everyone for contributing. But on a, on a kind of a, a tying up note, because I work at Craig Locker all the time, it's quite often um, I have very spooky um, connections or things that happen which are just quite random and odd, but just don't make any sense to me. But I was just thinking when we were talking about tunnels, how appropriate it is in both Sassoon and Owen's work, you know, the, the use of this tunnel analogy but there, there is now the Collington Tunnel. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but in the area that Owen would have known very well coming through Collington Village, um, at the back of that, there is a, an old disused railway tunnel, which was very um, run down. People were quite frightened to go into it because it's a tunnel on a curve and it's in a disused piece of the line for, for years. And recently, uh, only the end of uh, last year, they reopened the tunnel and it has a mural painted all the way through the tunnel. They put new lighting in and the mural uh, depicts Collington Worthies. So on one side of the wall, you have Owen and Sassoon and, and Craig Locker depicted on the mural. And on the other side is the words for, from Robert Louis Stevenson's poem, From a Railway Carriage, which you know is faster than fairies, faster than witches, bridges and houses and hedges and ditches and charging along like the troops in a battle, all through the meadows and horses and cattle. And <laughs> the connections with the railway and Owen and tunnels and Sassoon and the words of, of Robert Louis Stevenson's poems and, and Owen's links to Stevenson uh, and in the Pentland Hills just struck me that all these things are all coming together, both in sort of a, a, a memorial almost for, for Collington Village now uh, and a nod to the past and all these connections. So I just wanted to say if anyone ever gets out of this lockdown and comes to Edinburgh, <laughs> the Collington Tunnel is, is a, a very appropriate place to, to go. Uh, I haven't seen it for some time yet, but apparently they've done a really good job of it. So that's my <coughs> not very erudite contribution. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. And I think that's something we need to start planning as a WAO. Yes, <laughs> when we're out of this lockdown, um, I'm conscious that it's eight o'clock. I'm sure we, I mean, I could go on for hours, but um, we said eight o'clock. Um, I just wanted to, I think there were a couple comments within the, within the chat, um, which we may not have got to. I just wanted to share um, 
um, sort of Tim's message about um, the two, uh, but about let us sleep now being the two enemies reconciling, um, reconciling themselves. And I think that's still a definite reading. Um, and I think that's the, the wonderful power of this poem. And a lot, you know, Owen's poems is, is, is the multiple layers that exist um, and, and that we can take away from it. So yeah, really wonderful, thank you. Um, yes, given it's eight o'clock, I suppose we should let people have their dinner or whatever, but I, can I just ask everyone to thank Meg uh, again for yes, a really wonderful kickoff to this series. We really look forward to welcome you to the next one, which is on, no kidding, the 1st of April. Um, speaker um, and moderator to be announced soon, but we will be um, for that one looking at um, uh, Greater Love and the Apologia. Um, so that will be um, same time, uh, beginning of the month. And sorry, was someone asking a question? Sorry, no, okay. Um, just to say that um, our next event is the 18th for the birthday with Paul Norgate. You can sign up on Eventbrite and we very much look forward to seeing you then. Bonnie has put it conveniently in the chat. And um, yes, so um, I guess I should give the title of the talk. Um, and I mentioned Jane that um, it, the title of the talk is Reading Hiawatha and Writing Friendships. <laughs> and to be topical, it mentions both Collington and Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh, great. And <laughs> and so Catherine segued nicely into the next event. <laughs> <laughs> and completely un unpracticed, that was unintentional. <laughs> Well, well thanks, it's, so. it's all set. It, it's about Owen's experience in that area. Um, I don't know whether you want any more introduction, Jane, or whether you want to leave it that. I think we'll leave people to be intrigued. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how Meg. to send a message to Meg <laughs> to thank her. Thank you, Meg. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you all of you. Catherine, everybody else, and Catherine Walker. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Good to see you, Elizabeth. It's great to see everybody and thank you all for, for coming and for all your comments. Uh, well thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank Bye. you. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.